there's so much good in the world. There's so many good people doing good things. And that's really what the holidays are here to remind us, whether it's Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever, that we're really here to come together and do the right thing, be kind, be good, to love one another. And I know this is Healing Sunday, and it's something where Tammy, I saw you stand up, Tammy. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Tammy started getting our healers together, the professional experienced healers that know how to do energetic healing, and we provide that on the second Sunday. Um, and as the light we see from Hanukkah and the light from Christmas, today's healing will be about opening ourselves to more light. And what we do at the end of my talk is we invite the healers uh, to come up, people that Tammy has contacted, and you just put your hands out and we do a, just a healing of your body, opening you up that you're able to see, receive more goodness and light at this time. So thank you, Tammy. So today's talk is the season for comfort and joy. Well, we just had some comfort from Sharon and that beautiful reminder and her daughter's menorah and all of that was beautiful. Ernest Holmes defines joy as the emotion that is excited by the expectancy of good. The expectancy of good. And isn't that what Christmas and Hanukkah are all about? The expectancy of good. Knowing that good is ever present always. But it's a, the joy that comes when we know it and we feel it. And Emily, when you were reading about the bubbling up of joy, that's what we need to practice and cultivate. Because cultivating joy, joy I'm sorry to say, well, I'm happy to say, but I'm sorry to say that nobody here has more joy than anybody else. <laughs> we all are programmed with the same, the same joy. We're made of the same stuff. So no one has more joy inside because it's a divine quality we all hold. We experience more joy when we're more open to that divine flow and allow it to flow through us. True joy for me is when we feel joy even in the most difficult situations because we know there's possibilities that want to come forward, come forth, and we hold that because we have faith in something greater. I looked up the metaphysical meaning of Christmas because I knew we were talking about Hanukkah and Christmas, and it said the metaphysical meaning of Christmas is the expectancy of something greater, the birth of something greater. And the same with the miracle of Hanukkah. It's the something greater that we're looking for. You know, we talk about, especially at Christmas time, we have so much music and so much singing. And there's a song of life at the center of all our beings. We know the music of the spheres, I've mentioned that often, is the ancient philosophical concept of the relationship of the celestial, the celestial bodies, the earth and all the planets and everything in it, that there's a relationship of movement, of harmony and balance, working together to a rhythmic sound of music. And many of us call it the dance of life. And that's what's in all of us. It's that beautiful song of life that wants to be sung and released. And so when we talk about tis the season of joy, it's about tapping into that place within us where we can find that joy and that power. Um, Hafez, the beautiful 14th century Sufi mystic, talks about the joyous process of our spiritual communion with the divine, and he calls it God's laughter. He says God's laughter is joy. And it's that bubbling up feeling you can feel when it's percolating inside of you. It's the goodness that we want to feel. So we need to practice laughing a little more, laughing a little more. One of my um, favorite poets from some time ago, E.E. E. Cummings, a contemporary poet, he said, the most wasted of all days is one without laughter. And if we think about it as our laughter is the bubbling up of joy, of God's joy within us. It's not laughing at, it's laughing from the inside out. Uh, Joseph Campbell says, having a sense of humor saves you. It gives you a new view of your situation. 
a spiritual distance where you can stand back a little bit. And especially this time of year when there is, you know, we have music and we have decorations and we have parties and we have love and we have happiness and we have depression and we have loneliness and we have upset and we have pressure and we have expectation. It can bring a lot up during this time. So it's even more important than ever, than ever that we take time to center in and find the truth, the truth. You know, the Bible tells us to seek understanding, to get to wisdom. But if you remember, in 1989, it was Stephen Covey who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Any of us didn't look at that and review it, and I couldn't remember all, the, all of the, um, the habits. But he said his fifth habit, and this was the main tenet of his book, is seek for understanding and then to be understood. He said, that is the joy of life, when we can seek to understand what's going on with others and then to want to share our story. You know, if we, if we listen first and if we want to truly find joy in our life, <clears throat> number one, we have to listen to our own soul. So the truth comes up. So we remember why we're here. You know, the purpose of our life is... <clears throat> Number one, I feel compassion. That's why we're here, to learn to tap into our own souls and then learn how to be compassionate to ourself, number one. And once we do that, we can be a cause of joy and love for others. Doesn't that sound good, if we can do that? Um, if we remember, that I read this uh, author named Ben Okri. Hadn't heard of him before. He's a Nigerian author. He's written several books. Really soul-hearted man. He said, the most authentic thing about us is our capacity to create, to overcome, to endure, to transform, and to feel joy. He said, we have the power to be greater than any of our suffering, any of our problems. It comes from within. It's inherent within each of us. And that's what we have that we need to learn to tap into. Um, so if we decide to listen to our soul, Rumi says, when you do things from your soul, from your soul, from the inside of you, you feel a river moving through you a river moving f through you, and that river is joy. You know, I think the reason we get into that depression and loneliness and pressure and upset is because we're looking at the world from the outside in. We're taking the perspective of all that's out there instead of living the truth and the joy that wants to be expressed from within us. I think one of the greatest givers of joy is Mother Teresa. She taught her sisters in the charity, the sisters that all came together with the common goal to bring goodness to the least, to the least in the world. She taught them to find that joy that's expressed in your eyes, on your face, in your actions, to find that joy. And here's what she said I, she wanted them to feel. And this just this is a really moving, it's only a few words, but it's very, very moving to me. She said, I want all of that to be bubbled up so you can say to the world, just by your being, may my joy be in you. May my joy be in you. That's what she says with just her actions and her doing. She said, you know, we know that life moves in circles. And we have to be in the flow of life, giving and receiving. It's not just enough to give. It's about giving and receiving. She said she was walking down the streets of London one time, and there was this man sitting on the street, all hunched over and crumbled up, just kind of doubled up. He looked like, she says, he was so lonely, he looked like a throwaway. And she just went over and took his hand. And all she said is, how are you? And he said, oh, 
It's been so, so long since I felt the warmth of a hand. And he sat up straight, and she could see the joy in his eyes from a simple touch and a simple connection. She said, it's not the great things you do. It's the small things you do with great love. And then another time, so that's in the giving she went to give. The other time was in the receiving. She was saw a beggar, and uh, a beggar in India came up to her, and he said, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, everyone is always wanting to give to you. I want to give to you, too. I only had got ten pennies today, but the whole day I thought that I wanted to give it to you. And so he held out his hand, and Mother Teresa said she knew if she took those ten pennies, he may have to go to bed that night with no dinner, no food. But if she didn't take it, she'd hurt him. And she took it. And she said never in her life has she seen someone light up with such joy, such joy in all the money, all the food, everything she'd been given, to know that he had, he was worthwhile. He had someone, something he could give to someone else. We need to remember in this beautiful season, we need to be doing all of this, to be in this reciprocal process of life, to really be in joy. I'm going to close before our healing to share just a personal story, how joy just expanded in my life, well, I think in our life this week. You know, we, I have lived 48 plus years. <laughs> That's my married life, living around a grand piano. We've had pianos pulled up on these, whatever they do, over balconies to fit into our apartment. And so we've lived around grand pianos our whole life. I mean, that was kind of what we were. And then when we downsized about eight, nine years ago, we didn't have a piano. It's in the social home. So Kirk has one, two, uh, two pianos here. And then I bought a keyboard for the house, but he didn't like it, so he put it upstairs oh. in his office. So I keep looking for pianos he might like to have in the house. And I know from the goodness of his soul, he was thinking, no, we don't need to spend money on another piano. I have plenty of pianos. But it wasn't until a month ago I said, Kirk, but I don't have music in the house. You know, to expand your viewpoint. So I found a piano. And um, it's a Roland keyboard. So it's a good one. But it's in a, uh, it looks like an upright piano. It's a light oak case perfect place for it. It was delivered on Friday. We have music back in the house, and it feels so good. I mean, it was like you forget when you get something back. So Kirk plays his beautiful jazz Christmas music and all this. He taught me a song, and if Jameson was here, he would love it. Wheels on the bus. I don't know how to play the piano, and I'm not playing to for performance except to one little tiny, to uh, one little tiny person, but I mean, it's a good exercise, but I'm sitting there practicing wheels on the bus. Okay, bum, bum. <laughs> how do I get this in? So, but it is so fun. Thank you for opening up. Because when we open to something different and new, you know, he had expectations. and he took, But we also have to speak what we want. It's important. People can't read our minds. So I hope those lessons help this morning. And let's have our, our healers up here. And just, you know, if you stay in your seat, I want you to just do what Sharon had us do and what Emily sprinkled her magic wand over all of us, is just to be open to more light. And if you want, it's just a quick little healing. There's no touching going on. But just put your hands out like this so we can just do a little healing. Come on up if you're ready. And as our healing wall is just coming to a close right now, just please breathe in the light of God's infinite love and the goodness it holds. And allow yourself to be filled to the place of overflowing. Mm -hmm. And let your light meld with the other lights in this room as we let this be a beautiful ball of light and let this light radiate out and touch just surround this world in the kindness and joy that we've been talking about this morning. 
And if, we'll, if you'll just say with me, I know the song of joy, the song of love, and the essence of light is at the center of my being. It is my joy, my honor, and my blessing to share it with you. May the love and joy, and joy within me be yours. And so it is. God bless you all.